Okay, good morning everybody. Today we're going to talk about population genetics and species diversity. And this is kind of the nitty gritty nuts and bolts of how a species changes over time. So we're going to start off with Charles Darwin because he's widely recognized as the father of modern evolutionary theory. Contrary to popular belief though, he didn't think this up on his own. Nor was he the only one who came up with this idea of descent with modification, but he was the most famous, and he was also, incidentally, the wealthiest, because he married into the Wedgwood family and he got a lot of uh, power in the nobility. So let's start with what he did and how he got his ideas. Darwin signed on as the ship's naturalist in the HMS Beagle. The Beagle was originally a 10-gun naval ship that was refitted to do lay expeditions. On her second survey expedition, there were many difficulties with finding the appropriate crew members, and it was finally settled that they needed a gentleman naturalist who would basically pay to work on the ship's mission. The mission had few mishaps in getting started, but it finally set sail on December 27, 1831, and returned after a round-the-world surveying journey on October 2, 1836, so it took them five years to get all the way around. Galapagos Islands are an archipelago off the coast of what is now known as Costa Rica in South America. Geologically, archipelagos historically were used as part of the main, used to be part of the mainland, even if they are of volcanic origin, as some of the Galapagos are. They are still arranged so that one island is much closer to the mainland, and the rest form sort of stepping stones in which organisms that arrive from the mainland would progress in an orderly progression from near to far. So it's easy to kind of see how they change from island to island. After he returned from his nearly five-year voyage, Darwin did not publish his ideas. He sat on them for a number of reasons. One, he had a lot of nasty tropical diseases from his journey. Two, he was extremely methodical and wanted to publish all of his results fully thought out in what he anticipated to be a 30-volume set. You should see his work on barnacles if you don't believe me. Being as methodical as he was, he did a lot of research for possible explanations for why he observed what he thought were changes over time. Charles Lyell tried to use his data collection techniques to prov prove the biblical account of the flood. When doing his data collection, which consisted of counting how many grains of sand were deposited per week in a river over a period of many, many years, because Victorians needed hobbies, he developed two ideas that are now called ge geological uniformitarianism. He said that one, the processes that existed when God formed the earth are the same as those found today, and two, the processes that form geologic formations are unchangeable in their intensity from the formation of the earth to the present. In other words, the same stuff that happened then happens now. Lyell determined that based on his research, the earth was much older than the supposed 6,000 years. It was that these ideas that led Darwin to propose that change in a species over time could occur over a very long time instead of very suddenly. So Charles Lyell set out to prove a biblical account and came out finding out that it wasn't possible to be only 6,000 years old. Thomas Malthus was also a big influencer of Darwin. He was a minister and a demographer. When examining how populations expand, he determined that a population expands exponentially and that any limited resource can only expand linearly. And the difference between the population and the resources is what he called a Malthusian catastrophe. He determined that with human populations when this occurs, the only way to resolve the catastrophe was through natural causes such as accidents in old age, misery such as war, pestilence, plague, and above all famine, and vice, which for Malthus included infanticide, murder, contraception, and homosexuality, so that the excess human population could be disposed of. So Darwin wrote on the origin of species to solidify his ideas of descent of a species over time and published it in 1859. In it, he came up with three principles. Darwin used the ideas of artificial selection in which a farmer selects positive traits in livestock and applied those ideas to how nature works on selecting traits in a species. Populations make more offspring than can be supported by the environment. 
individuals have an unequal ability to survive and reproduce, and the competition for limited resources such as mates, food, shelter, water, or others will allow some organisms to survive and reproduce and others to not. This ability is referred to as an individual's fitness. So gradualism is how Darwin v visualized natural selection happening. He thought the species split and developed into new species over very long periods of time with very clear intermediate steps through this process. However, many fossil records show that there are long periods of time in which there are no visible changes in a line, in some lines. In some lines, we see gradualism all the way through. Um, but suddenly, change will occur without the intermediates. And many biologists today believe that in certain fossil lines, such as horses and whales, gradualism is the prevailing mechanism. However, that is unusual in the fossil record. In most other lines, there is no change until there is a massive change in the selective environment, and then you have a burst of new forms appearing. This combination of ideas is referred to as the modern synthesis theory because it combines gradualism and punctuated equilibrium. So animals who have a greater fitness survive in an environment to live and reproduce. Random changes or mutations can lead to greater or lesser fitness. In other words, mutations are the single thing that changes in a species to allow change over time to happen. Adaptations allow an organism to survive better in their environment. You can see here a very well camouflaged moth. Mutations and variety are what allow diversity within a population. And you can see this is Arabidopsis, which is a type of mustard. This shows variability in Arabidopsis plants from different geographic regions. They're all the same species, but they all look different. One of the things that is a selective factor that's kind of due to chance is called genetic drift. All cases of genetic drift happen due to random chance, and genetic drift changes the relative proportions of genes in a population. Genetic bottlenecks are caused by random events in which a large population is reduced to a small number of individuals. This is most obviously seen in cheetahs, but can also be seen in other species that are brought back from the brink of extinctions. For example, the Florida panthers, there's less than 50 of those in the wild, and um, almost all of them now have heart defects because the few that survived happened to carry the gene for it. There's also the founder effect. The founder effect happens when a population of organisms moves to a new area, and due to the chance, the relative proportions of the gene pool are shifted. So, for one example is the black squirrels in Canada. Um, they were a small population of squirrels, eastern gray squirrels, that happened to carry the black gene, and uh, they were isolated on the Canadian side by the glacier that cut Niagara Falls. Well, um, because of that, there's a lot of black squirrels up there, and there's hardly any in uh, south of that uh, Niagara Falls. Also, another one is polydactyly, and you can see the picture here of someone's hand with the sixth finger. In this case, it's a thumb. Polydactyly is about 25% of the population of Amish in the United States have polydactyly. And um, that's because a few members of their population had it, and it's a dominant gene. And when they founded their communities here in America, when they came over from Europe, they were very isolated, insulated communities, and so they only had they only married within their own religious community. So that gene became magnified, and you saw more and more polydactyly. When genetic equilibrium is present in a population, evolution does not occur. There are going to be a lot of conditions that are in order that need to be there in order to say that a population is in equilibrium and we're not going to go into that here because it deals with a lot of theoretical mathematical models. Adaptations allow for an organism to better survive and reproduce in a particular environment. Adaptations can arise in response to environmental pressures such as temperature, antibiotic resistance, and pesticide resistance. So let's take a look at antibiotic resistance. Uh, this is a very big problem, especially amongst uh, community MRSA and things like that that are developing today. 
Um, the problem is, is that people don't take all the antibiotics that they should. And so they basically create superbugs and then pass them on to other people. Um, and our overuse of antibiotics has also created this situation in antibacterial products, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, basically what happens is if you throw antibiotics at a population of organisms, microorganisms, it's going to kill off the weak ones, but the stronger ones uh, that are res that have a resistant gene to the antibiotic are going to be the ones that survive and breed. So selection can happen in a couple of different ways. Direction, directional selection is going to favor an extreme form. The form selected for the chain for can change if the environmental conditions change. So in other words, one of the directional selection classic cases is Biston betularia, which is the peppered moth. And it ha comes basically in a white flavor with black spots and a black flavor with white spots. And when the environment changed when the industrial revolution started up and the uh, soot was soaking on the trees the black moths were selected for because they blended in and now that they've scrubbed that um, and there's no longer soot on the trees the white moths blend in with the aspen trees there so there's more white moths than black moths because the black moths are getting eaten Disruptive selection is going to favor both extreme forms, and we see this in certain uh, tide pool organisms, for example. Stabilizing selection favors the middle form, um, and so that's what you see in like human height. That's a stabilizing selection. We're all kind of in the middle, mostly. So geographic isolation is the most common method by which new species are created for animal species. And reproductive barriers occur either because of the reproductive organs don't match up, in other words, tab A and slot B don't go, or the sperm can't live in the reproductive tract of the female, or the offspring die, or can't reproduce themselves, or when the times in which they reproduce don't match up. There's a lot of different reproductive barriers, obviously. Changes in chromosome numbers can create new species within a home range of another species, and this is most common in plants because you get a lot of polyploidy in plants. Adaptive radiation happens in archipelagos, especially when a founder species moves into a new ecological role and becomes new species to better fit these roles. And this is what Darwin first identified in the finch species found on the Galapagos Islands. Finally, there's two basic types of evolution, and this is where we're going to conclude the lecture. Convergent evolution happens when unrelated lines begin to resemble one another because they fill the same role in their environment. So you see those analogous structures like we talked about in the last lecture with the dolphin looking like the shark and so on and so forth. Divergent evolution happens when one line begins to split apart and fill new roles in their environments. And you get homologous structures as a result. And you can see here with the placentals and marsupials, and that's a, an example of divergent evolution in mammals. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes this lecture. We're going to move on into classification systems and an overview of the kingdoms next. Have a good day.